ಗುರುರೇವ ಗತಿ ಗುರುಮೇವ ಭಜೆ ಗುರುಣೈವ ಸಹ ಅಸ್ಮಿ ನಮೋ ಗುರವೇ ನ ಗುರೋ ಪರಮಂ ಶಿಶುರಸ್ಮಿ ಗುರೋರ್ಮತಿರಸ್ತಿ ಗುರೌ ಮಮ ಪಾಹಿ ಗುರೋ ರಾಮ್ 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 ಸೊ ವಿ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಸ್ಟಾರ್ಟೆಡ್ ವಿತ್ ಅನ್ ಇಂಡಿವರ್ ಟು ಅಂಡರ್ಸ್ಟ್ಯಾಂಡ್ ಸುಕ್ತಿ ರತ್ನಾನಿ ಇನ್ ಲಿಟ್ಲ್ ಮೋರ್ ಡೀಟೇಲ್ ಸಿನ್ಸ್ ದ ಲಾಸ್ಟ್ ಫ್ಯೂ ಕ್ಲಾಸಸ್ ಸೊ ಇನ್ ದ ಲಾಸ್ಟ್ ಕ್ಲಾಸ್ ವಿ ಕಂಪ್ಲೀಟೆಡ್ ಟು ಸುಕ್ತಿ ರತ್ನಾನಿ ಒನ್ ಇಸ್ ಸುಕ್ತಿ ರತ್ನಾನಿ ನಂಬರ್ ಫೋರ್ ದಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಉದ್ಯೋಗಿನಂ ಪುರುಷ ಸಿಂಹ ಮುಪೈತ್ ಲಕ್ಷ್ಮೀ ವಿಚ್ ಇಸ್ ಟೇಕನ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಪಂಚತಂತ್ರ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ದಿ ಸೆಕೆಂಡ್ ಒನ್ ವಿ ಡಿಡ್ ವಾಸ್ ನೈನ್ತ್ ಒನ್ ಸಂಭಾವಿತ ಚಾಕೀರ್ತಿ ಮರಣಾದ ಅತಿರಿಚ್ಯತೆ ವಿಚ್ ಇಸ್ ಟೇಕನ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಭಗವದ್ಗೀತಾ ಓಕೆ ಸೊ ವಿ ಅಗೇನ್ ಟುಡೇ ವಿಲ್ ಗೋ ಬ್ಯಾಕ್ ಟು ನಂಬರ್ ಫೈವ್ ಸೊ ಎನಿ ಒನ್ ಹ್ಯಾಸ್ ಎನಿ ಐಡಿಯಾ ಫ್ರಮ್ ವೇರ್ ಇಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಟೇಕನ್ ಸೊ ದ ಫಿಫ್ತ್ ಶ್ಲೋಕ ಇಸ್ ಟೇಕನ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಕಾಳಿದಾಸ ಕುಮಾರ ಸಂಭವ ಸೊ a very famous uh, work that you all know about it is taken from kalidasas kumara sambhava again we have already discussed about kalidasa so no more further introduction is probably needed we have already discussed about kalidasa his works his probable time and of course his uh, various kritis we have already discussed one major work of his that is abhijnana shakuntalam which we already discussed so today we are going to another beautiful work called kumara sambhava we'll come to the story in a little later but again kalidasa the beauty is we don't know anything about him but there are a lot of loka katha that is folklore around him which give us a lot of introduction about him for example we discussed that kalidasa was not born was not a born genius it was you know god is kali who bestowed knowledge so all these are loka katha it's not a fact we don't know we never know that if this happened but probably considering the situation that is told of course we know that um, in kali yuga it is very difficult for a person to see kali in actual uh, form and get the blessing hopefully it is true but still it is considered to be a loka katha to just bring more fame to kali rasa so in, in all those this thing so one more beautiful uh, loka katha that i came across and which i feel like sharing here is so it is told that kali rasa again with an intention to learn a lot of knowledge and to gain more um, idea about how to write literature how to write kavyas he has left his home and he has gone to various places to learn and gain knowledge but his wife is alone at home so after a very long time our uh, kalidasa has somehow probably gained some knowledge and he has come back so once he uh, comes is it not uh, i mean one interpretation i heard is that his wife was a, had a very strong tongue to escape from her he went away ha huh, that is also true but in the uh, katha that i have come across so this is the idea so he has gone out to gain some knowledge but he has gone out for a very long time leaving his wife alone and having gone out he has come after a very long time so the first thing the you know wife asks even before asking are you okay you know do you want to rest nothing so the first thing she asks is asti kaschit vagvishesha so the meaning is asti kaschit vagvishesha so vagvishesha is something important in your speech or have you learned something beautiful in your speech asti is there kaschit something vagvishesha some significant improvement or importance to your words beauty of this sentence is kalidasa takes this sentence and creates three mahakavyas using the first word of the mahakavyas of each words asti kashtit vak so he uses these three words to create three different mahakavyas starting from these three words so that is one mopa katha that i you know totally loved uh, the loka katha because and the beauty of your surya tritiya book is all these three mahakavyas are there in the sukta ratnani in the sukta ratnani itself you have these three mahakavyas in which you have asti as the first word kashchit as the second word and vak as the third word so i wanted to tell this because anyway we'll be covering all these three lessons so it will be a good introduction to all the three so this is one you know um, side note that i wanted to mention asti kashchit vak vishesha now coming to the work itself kumara sambhava it is assumed like it is the um, it is what scholars have agreed that it is probably the last work of kalidasa there are multiple reasons for this and it is told that he started with madavika agnimitra so madavika agnimitra is told to be the starting point of kalidasa's literary life and kumara sambhava is considered to be the end or the last work of kalidasa why this consensus has been brought out is there are multiple reasons but i would like to share two of them firstly see whenever you start as an author what you try to do is first you try to gain number of people so you try to gain number of readers so that you have a larger following and whenever you write a work there are people to support you financially morally everything because for a kavi to survive the only way he you know source of income is his works so if he has to do that he should be able to get some people 
so what you start doing is you start telling very interesting stories and very you know uh, the stories that people will like so you don't worry about whether your you know work is you know of prime importance if you have some good vocabulary you don't worry all you have to do is you start with a story that people will start to like similarly started with madhavi kagni mitra which is a very good you know um, love story which attracted people okay they were they thought okay he has written a very good work and they started following him why kumar sambhava is considered to be the last work is now after having written so many works madhavi kagni mitra vigyana shakuntala raghuvamsha uh, meghaduta so many works he has already written so now he has gained enough literary capacity that now he does not worry about story length initially he started with madhavi kagni mitra because it was a very popular story and people will like it but now he is not worried about the story line because he is confident that whatever be the story line he can bring in his literary capabilities to still make it a mahakavya so understanding so from this only you should understand that kumara sambhava's story is not a very prominent story and it's not a very grasping story like for example bricha katikam last sorry mudra rakshan we discussed so it is a very interesting story wherein you were curious to know what is happening but this story is very open it's a very you know simple story line but kalidasa's literary vocabulary literary strengths are brought out in this so he's showing that give me any simple story i will make it interesting so that is what is being shown in kumar sambhav but and okay this is a first reason because he has kumar you know kalidasa has gained enough literary credibility that he is able to bring out such a beautiful work that is first reason second reason is probably the most arguable reason that people consider because the actual work kumar sambhava is told to be having 17 sargas so now as i have told you so bhagavad gita is divided into adhyayas ramayana is divided into kandas uh, mahabharata is divided into parvas similarly any mahakavya is usually divided into something called sargas or cantos so there is it is told that you know the actual uh, kumar sambhava has 17 cantos but literary you know critics having gone through these 17 cantos have told that kalidasa has only written eight first eight cantos of this and the later parts or the later cantos have been written by some imitator who wants to, who wants to just completed the work so considering that to be the case probably kalidasa expired before he could write the work or he lost his you know capabilities to continue working on some great work like this by the time he finished so it is told that only the first 7 to 8 sargas are written by kalidasa and the remaining else is just something that is written by some low low poet who just wanted to complete the work now this is the brief introduction about kumara sambhava now coming to the plot as i have told you the plot is not a very you know intricate plot with a lot of interesting story it's a very simple this thing so of course you will already would have so if you can understand kumara sambhava so kumara is nothing but kartikeya sambhava is nothing but occurrence so the occurrence or the birth of kartikeya kumara sambhava is how kartikeya is born so the plot is very simple you know kartikeya was born by shiva and parvati's marriage so very simple plot sambhava is sambhava is occurrence. occurrence so occurrence of kartikeya is nothing but indirectly the birth of kartikeya as you know it's a very simple plot but kalidasa being kalidasa he has brought in so much of beauty into this that surely this is probably one of the best mahakavyas in the entire literary world now the plot the background plot so the story line is this so kumar sambhava is the birth of kartikeya the background plot is this so at this point of time what has happened is tarakasura he is the demon and he has come into power tarakasura is one of the demons who has again performed a lot of penance on brahma and what is the boon he asks so okay and we have seen all throughout mythology we have seen several demons have asked for several groans which are causing a lot of trouble to several gods now tarakasura is a very clever person the boon he asks is i should only be killed by the sun born to shiva so his boon is he can only be killed by the sun born to lord shiva and why did he ask shiva because okay of course shiva could have you know begetted a son but why did he only ask shiva why not vishnu why not uh, brahma because of course you know brahma has the power to make manasa putras vishnu also has you know the power to create uh, life but one more reason why he chose shiva is at this point of time sati has fallen into the fire in daksha yagna and she has died and shiva who has for the first time in his life fallen in love with the lady like sati 
is now totally uninterested towards worldly intentions. So a very clever choice because he knows now that Shiva has lost Sati, he'll surely not be interested in any further marriage or any worldly, you know, expectations. So he's the right person to choose for this task. So that is why he chooses Shiva and tells it the person, the son born into Shiva will be able to kill him. So now we all know Shiva, once he has, after Sati is dead, like after Sati is dead, Shiva goes into meditation and becomes a Mahayogi. So he is totally, he does not come out of Himalaya. He's sitting at Himalaya, always doing penance, always into meditation. And that is his current state. So this is the starting point of Kumara Samhara. So Taraka Sura has come to power. He has got this boon. And now the gods are, you know, busy making plans of what to do. Now, coming to uh, the first shloka, as I've told you, Asti Kaschit Vagvisheshaha. Using that, Kumara Sambhava starts with Asti. So Kumara Sambhava's first shloka is Astyuttarasyam Dishidevatatma Himalayo Nama Nagadhi Rajaha Purva Paruto Yanidhi Vagahya Sthita Prithivya Iva Mana Danda. So it starts with Asti Uttarasyam Dishi. So it starts with Asti. So uh, this is the first shloka. But as I've told you, since Kaladasa has probably written only the first seven to eight sargas, any person who has, who has written commentaries on Kumar Sambhava also has taken up only these first to seven to eight sargas. So probably if I get any source, because I didn't find any source that has all the 17 sargas, so I've mostly found only the first seven to eight sargas. So probably that will be... Books, that's what, we don't have any source which tell that these are the complete 17 sargas. That too, at least I have not found it. So the only manuscripts that I have found are only dealing with the first seven to eight sarkas. So that is one more reason why people believe that he, did, he wrote only seven. So probably, so if I get a manuscript with all the 17, I'll probably you know go through and give out the story. But as of now, I only have the story of the first seven sarkas. So I will be discussing that. Of course, it is a, though the storyline is very simple, the, story, the description is quite good. So I'll probably again take two to three classes for just Kumara Sambhava again. So the first sarga of Kumara Sambhava deals with the description of Himalaya alone. So the entire first sarga is dedicated to Himalayas. Because I know, you know, Parvati is Shailaputri. She is the daughter of Himalaya. So since the person who is a source of Parvati should be described, you know, Kaladasa has taken the time to describe Himalayas in the very first canto. And this very first shloka, Asthyuttarasyam Dishidevatatma also describes Himalaya. Asti Uttarasyam Dishi. There exists in the north Himalayo Nama Nagadi Raja. There lives a king of mountains called Himalaya. And how is he? Purva Paro Koi Nidhi Vagakya. So, as you can see, Himalayan range extends from east to west such that on the east it is touching the you know, Arabian Sea and in the west it is touching the Bay of Bengal. So, Purva Apara, who has been, whose feet is being constantly washed by rivers on his left on the east and the west. So he's so large, is what Kalidasa is saying. He's so vast that even on the east coast, east part of his, you know, ranges, he's being washed by one samudra. And even on the west coast, he's being washed by another samudra. So, so vast is he. And even more vast how he is, is what he's saying is, Sthitaha Prithivya, Mima Manadanda. Now he's so tall that he's no a Manadanda. He's a measurement. He's a source of measurement. So you can consider him to be the measure to see what is the greatness of a person. So he's so great that he's no a measure to compare the greatness of others. So starting with this beautiful shloka, Kalayasa starts with the description of Himalayas. So we'll probably discuss the only the first sarga today because we have quite limited time and uh, the sargas are beautiful in this uh, lesson. So as I've told you, the first sarga describes Himalayas. What is Kalayasa describing in Himalaya? First of all, he has already described the height of Himalayas, the greatness of Himalaya. Second thing he's describing is Himalaya is a source of a lot of gems because precious stones like ore, gold, silver, everything is brought from the earth. So he's telling that Himalaya is a source of all types of precious metals and gems. Also, when creating Himalaya, Brahma has made sure that every type of medicine is available on Himalaya. And that is why even in um, Ramayana, he comes to Himalaya, particularly Dronagiri, to take the Sanjeevini um, medicine for Lakshmana, Hanuman comes there. That is the greatness because Himalayas mountain ranges are so much filled with um, beautiful things like gems or you know, precious ores or even medicinal plants. Secondly, 
the plants the, the the animals and birds in this particular himalaya are also beautifully described by um, kalidasa telling that you have a lot of different you know mountain lions there are different types of deer that are available he and he describes the individual plants and flowers that are present he describes what are the different trees that are growing in himalaya so the entire description if you read kalidasa's kumar sambhava you will really you will actually be transported to himalayas because he is describing every aspect of himalaya he does not stop there he further describes because it's a you know mountain there will be a lot of tribes so he describes the tribes that are residing in himalayas what are their customs what are their traditions how do they dress and what are their hunting styles so everything beautifully um, our, you know kavi kalidasa has described he tells you know, so there is a particular type of hunters who are hunting lions and the thing is the you know the um, beautiful thing he describes is let us say you are in a proper land like a forest rather than himalayas if you are in a forest if a lion kills someone his paws are always you no know, uh, filled with blood so when he walks you can actually see the blood stains but himalaya is covered with snow so as he starts moving once him you know covers you can't see so the hunters find it difficult to capture the lions in himalayas but still what happened the the reason he tells this is still the hunters have found a way the beauty of himalayas is there is a pretty all the elephants have have a particular property their head has a particular jewel so whenever a lion kills these elephants those jewels are stuck to its paw and as it starts walking these jewels fall off and that is what these hunters follow to detect these lions so again how he got, got such an idea is called as a first year so it describes how hunters perform these hunting activities all this one more thing he tells is there is a very beautiful shloka which says that see himalaya is so good in so many he has such good qualities he has medicinal plants he has so many good animals he is you know giving shelter to so many birds and plants but still there is only one problem that he has he is very cold so he has all positive aspects but the only negative aspect that himalaya has is that he is very cold and it's always covered with snow but continuing to tell uh, that the you know the beautiful uh, qualities of himalaya it is that if a good person if a person has several good qualities and there are just one or two bad qualities the good qualities will cover this bad quality the beautiful uh, line it says एको ही दोषो गुण सन्निपाते निमज्जति इंदो हो किरणेश्वी बांका है। So this very limited one or two bad qualities that a person have is covered by the several good qualities has similar to how in the moon. So we know moon has a you no know, mark called शशांक का। So it is told that it is one of the mark that is uh, there on the moon, but it does not make the moon less beautiful. It makes it even more beautiful. So similar to how the moon. because of its other good qualities like the moonlight or the you know coolness of the moon this one bad quality of the shankar is let go of similarly in a good person if he has several good qualities all the bad qualities that he has are covered eko hi dosho guna sannipate one small bad you know quality is covered by even the large amount of good qualities and it is does not affect his greatness so again this is a beautiful aspect again kumar sambhava the thing is at every point whenever he gets a chance kalidasa tries to give some good life lessons that is why we should read kumar sambhava kumar sambhava the plot is very simple but you should read kumar sambhava to understand these small small points why is it important is for two reasons firstly it gives you knowledge secondly it tells you that the traditions that you are following now have been there even then even then so even during the times of kalidasa these traditions have been there these good words have been there and it is continuing for example if as we go across you'll come to know that see currently when you when you have a small girl child who's playing what does she play with she plays with small dolls she makes her own doll house she makes these cooking utensils and she plays with that kalidasa even in his kumara sambhava has explained the childhood of parvati and he has explained there also that she also played with toys she also made small small kids and told that ah this is my son this is my daughter and she also made a doll house for herself so all that is there which proves that we are still you know still following the same traditions that even our ancestors followed so that is one another reason why we should read these mahagrantas now after having described all this one more beautiful aspect he tells is see the sun what is the greatness of sun he destroys darkness everywhere so his sun is told to be the destroyer of darkness but still darkness is also something that should be given prominence so 
darkness is running around the entire world trying to find a place to hide because everywhere you know uh, the sun's rays can even you know penetrate through the most darkest places what we know so the darkness is trying to find a place to survive and finally what it does is it comes to himalayas because himalaya has so many uh, caves that are so deep that even sunlight can't pass so he is again you know describing the cinematic beauty of himalayas is saying that himalaya is a source of so many caves that even darkness can come and take shelter and see our common assumption is darkness is bad and light is good but still again kalidasa brings out a very beautiful you know uh, shloka telling that kshudropi nunam sharanam prapanne mamatva mucche sharanam uh, shirasa sativa so it is that if a person is very good and if he is very noble he even gives shelter to the bad why because he knows his good qualities will change the bad person so it's not like you know he is, does not let go he does not tell i won't give shelter to the bad person he even takes the bad people and gives them shelter because he is so noble and he is sure that his good qualities will convert the bad person into the good one so he so indirectly saying that himalaya is giving shelter to the darkness in his caves because he is so good that he is sure that even the darkness will become good so again every point will you know understand that kalidasa is trying to give you some good knowledge finally what happens is again now this is all describing himalaya and after describing himalaya he tells it after some time himalaya marries mena who is you know gunavati so as bitter she is a gunavati she is a rupavati so both of them are similar in their guna lakshana and their qualities as you know marriage should be done between two people who have the same quality same type of you know family everything so in the you know kumar sambhav also kalidasa tells that himalaya is married to mena who is equivalent to himalayas in guna shila and dharma everything so mena is the you know, wife of um, himalaya now uh, the first son that they give birth to himalaya and mena is that but uh, mainaka so mainaka parvata we again we see in ramayana when mainaka comes to the surface to help um, hanuman so mainaka is the first son of himalaya and mena the second uh, no child that they should give birth to is parvati and parvati is nothing but sati's reincarnation so sati when she dies again she you know that she has to be born so when she is decides to be born she decides to be born as shailaputri the daughter of himalaya so the second uh, child of himalaya is parvati and parvati as you know parvatasya apatyam stri since she is the daughter of parvata raja she is called parvati again we come across another name so there is a shloka in the uh, uh, kumar sambhava which tells that later on as she grew up you know her relatives again you know people start giving nicknames people start giving calling you by some shorter name so she is also started calling she also is starting you know being called uma why is she being called uma is so u in sanskrit is like sambodhana o u in sanskrit can be used as an o and ma is do not so later on in the story you'll come to know that parvati decides to do a penance but since her mother tells o parvati do not o ma o do not that gives her the name uma so o is o ma is do not so she is directly the situation is context is do not do the penance but the words o and ma are only taken to give her the name uma so uma means do not so that is the name she again starts because parvati is probably a very big name for them to call uma is a very short name so they start calling her by the name uma and it is told that she is starts growing in a very fast pace and it is you know even kalidasa mentions that um, girls grow faster than boys so he t- compares her growth to the how shukla paksha and krishna paksha so how every day the moon gradually grows during the shape in a shukla paksha she is already big so she is dine dine sa parivardhamana so every every day you can see some development in her she is growing to some extent every day so she is growing very fast is what kalidasa is telling and uh, finally after reaching some time she is you know reaches adolescence so now she is of a marriageable age one point of time what happens is narada comes to meet himalaya and he sees parvati sitting next to Him- himalaya so you know again uh, you know girls are more you know dear to the fathers so probably he, uh, she always sits with the father so she is sitting with the father and you know him narada comes to her place and seeing parvati he tells ha now we are you know daughter is uh, at a marriageable age and surely she will marry shiva 
still tell still predict of course narada will know but still he predicts that your daughter will be the one who, one who will marry shiva having listened to this himalaya is very happy of course if you take daksha and sati daksha was totally mad that you know sati is you know deciding to marry shiva but himalaya because he is the person who is giving shelter to you know shiva kailas is one of the you know, himalayan ranges himalayan peaks so and he is the aradya deva of himalaya and considering that the daughter itself will marry shiva he is very happy and what happens is even though she has reached a marriageable age he is not ready to give any other person his daughter's hand because narada has told her you know, she'll marry you know shiva he's decided okay whatever happens she'll marry shiva only but what happens is you now shiva is a mahayogi at this point of time beautifully you know this uh, kalidasa has explained ayachitaram nahi deva devam adris sutam grahaitum shashaka abhyartana bhanga bhayena sadhu adyat adhyartam ishte avalambya tirthe what is telling is so now you know usually the you know the boy should be you know the person who comes and you know asks for the girl's hand so himalaya is waiting ayachitaram so he is waiting for shiva to send some you know request that you know that tell marry your daughter so he is waiting but ayachitaram that shiva is not asking ayachitaram so that shiva is not even asking for any you know request to marry his daughter what do we do adri sutam pragrahaitam shashaka but he is not ready to go and you know present the request so he wants shiva to send the first request which she wants to accept readily but he is not ready to go and be the first person to ask why again kalidasa beautifully gives the you know uh, reason abhyartana bhanga bhayena sadhu great people they are afraid of rejection they don't they what they feel is if i give an offer and someone does not accept what will happen so they are always in the fear that their offer might be rejected and it's because of this fear that are you know adri uh, that is parvata raja he did not go and give the first request beautiful shloka abhyartana bhanga bhayena sadhu because of the fear of being rejected great people like himalaya also do not want to present a request and you know finally you know what happens is uh, he decides what to do because she's already you know reach his she's already in the marriageable age and still there is no request so what he finally thinks is okay let me go meet shiva it's not directly asking him let me find some way so he'll go to lord shiva he'll you know perform the you know prayers he'll you know worship him and after that he'll make a small request he'll tell oh shiva so you have a lot of you know work to be done so every day you need some water to bathe you need some you know flowers to be given so you have so many things and your ganas are probably not very good so they always are involved in some sort of mischief so why don't you let my daughter and her sakis come and help you so they'll help you with a daily ritual so every day you have to you know get some water they'll get it for you you need some flowers they'll get it for you so they'll do the work but please let my daughter and her you know sakis come and serve you for some time and shiva the thing is of course shiva is a mahayogi but um, he does not know what to tell because uh, himalaya is his greatest devotee if he tells no it will be a, you know it will be discourages for the you know himalaya so again beautifully uh, kalidasa presents that shiva accepts but why does he accept he tells pratyarthi bhutam apitam samadhe shushrushamanam girishonu mene vikar hetau sati vikriyante yesham na chetam sita eva dhira so at this, this point of time what do we know about shiva shiva is a mahayogi that he is not in, interested in worldly affairs but is there any proof for that of course you can tell he is three, one of the three devas whatever he tells should be true but in order to prove that he is not interested in worldly affairs he accepts because vikar hai to only in the times of disturbance when you have distractions around you if you are you know steadfast only then will people realize that you are steadfast if you just by you know verbally tell that yeah i am steadfast i am not distracted people don't believe if there are distractions around you and still you are not distracted that is when your you know um, confidence and your self control is brought into picture so vikara hetu even the, when you are in the presence of the cause of distractions yesham na chetamsi na yesham na chetamsi na vikriyante whose senses do not waver because he is being a mahayogi when there are women around him he if he is not a you know self controlled person he may get you know deflected and may get get distracted so he accepts the offer of himalaya to keep sati or parvati in himalaya because if he is a, if i am able to maintain my self control even if Par, when in the presence of parvati and other distractions then people will surely know that my you know penance is true and i am self controlled person so beautifully again kalidasa mentions vikar hetu sati vikriyanti even in the presence of distractions if a person does not waver that truly signifies that he is under self control and totally in his control so that is why he accepts and tells it okay you can you know your daughter parvati and the other sakis can come and sir 
So with this, we end the first sarga. So in the first sarga, what we have seen is we have described Himalaya. We have described his marriage to Mena. We have again spoken about the birth of the first son, that is Mainaka, and we have also described the birth of uh, Parvati. And how finally, some by some means, Himalaya has made sure that Parvati reaches the place of Shiva, whom she is to marry. So this is this ends the first sarga of Kumar Sambhava. And um, again, why I am taking it in so much of detail is I want you to understand those, you know, beautiful points because as a just in the first, you know, um, Sarga itself, we discussed like four or five beautiful shlokas. And again, if you read the actual Kumar Sambhava as well, the you know growing of you know, Parvati is also very beautifully displayed. Of course, since we don't have time, I'm not covering that. But again, if you read, if you take time to read, Kardasa's poetic greatness is again, you can read multiple times. So with this, we'll end the first Sarga and the class today. Next week, we'll, you know, retake the retake Kumar Sambhava and continue from here. So with that, we'll end today's class. Okay. गुरु रे वगति ही गुरु में वभजे गुरु नहीं वसा स्मिनमो गुरे वे न गुरो परमं शिशुरस्मि गुरोर मतिरस्ति गुरो मम पाहि गुरो राम राम